Recording in progress. Thank you all so much for leading to pray. Father God, we just come boldly before your throne of grace. We thank you so much for being full time in our life. We ask that you allow us to heart. God, please allow us to apply what we need to apply in our lives so that we can live a life of abundance, God. I just wanted to pray. Specifically today, this to just come into all of our hearts and sing from our hearts, God, of everyone, Father God. So just hear your voice, you, Father God. Just equip those that need comforted and just equip them with the Holy Spirit so that they can be comforted, God, because you are our comforter, Lord. And so we just appreciate you today, Lord. We thank you so much for just tuning your ears to hear our voice, God. And we just ask that you just please allow your will to be done. God, I thank you so much for giving me your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us access to the Holy Spirit. And so, Father God, give us the ability to have our hearts softened enough, melted for you, God, that we just authorize your power in our life. We accept your will. We accept your plan and purpose for us, God. So we authorize the Holy Spirit to lead us in the path of righteousness so that we can have a life of abundance, Lord. God, we cancel every satanic every satanic plot scheme of the enemy, and we cancel it upon our life right now in Jesus' name. We just ask that you just allow us to just fulfill the things that you have called us to do and that you've chosen us to do, Lord. And most importantly, God, please allow your will to be done. Pray that um, the Holy Spirit just please allow me to say everything I need to today. Minister grace to the hearer. Allow us to just um, resonate on your word, God. Let it marinate in our hearts. Let it transform our minds so that we will not be conformed to this world, Lord, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let us put away our old selves and and, and walk in the, the new person that you created us to be, Lord. The spiritual birth of a new person, Lord God. And allow us to have qualities and traits that, that are pleasing to you and obedience to you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your home and blood. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me today on Lost Life and Health. Let's talk about it. So um, today I am going to be continuing on in the discussion of um, women's health. So um, before I get started on that, I need to actually do a couple more things here. Um, I just wanted to direct everyone, please, please send me an email if you have any questions about anything that we are discussing on the blog um send me a email request if you have a prayer request um send it to laws life health at sudden changes corporation dot org um if you wanted to suggest a topic please go ahead and send me an email and um i'll be sure to respond to you within 48 hours also if you are interested in um, possibly becoming an author um, I will need a, like a recommendation letter from your church. I can send you an application and, um, if that goes well, I would also need a recommendation letter from like a member of the church. So if you all, um, wanted to do some community service, so just say that you are having to do community service for, um, for court, you can uh, send me an email. I can send you an application so that you can uh, do some community service. This is, a, I do have a 501c3, which is a nonprofit organization. And um, I am an approved agency for community service. If you are interested in possibly becoming an intern, you can also send me an uh, email at uh, info at sudden changes corporation.org. Okay. And so if you all um, have any questions at all, please go ahead and put it. Okay. If you have any questions on the Audible apps, any of those, you can just go ahead and type it in the comments and I'll respond to you there. And so um, today I want to talk about a few things. I know that on Friday I was talking about eugenics and the, some of the supporters of eugenics and how it's becoming so prominent in society, specifically within the transgender population of individuals. And um, so this is something that 
it can cause a lot of people to be uncomfortable. It isn't something that's um that has been pop you uh like polarized in a way where we the, the main pop the people are accepting of these um transitions and detransitions of children. Um this is a sensitive subject matter and um I just want to state that this is also going to be a podcast today that is somewhat explicit. So if you are not interested in hearing anything explicit, please go ahead and remove yourself from this podcast because I will be talking about some sensitive information. And um, if you'd like to read about it, you can. But please understand that these are explicit conversations. If you wanted to come on as a, as a speaker or on the panelist, please let me know and I may consider it, okay? So um, going forward, back to eugenics. So there was a lot of discussion um, surrounding the use of eugenics um, in the early 1900s. And so I was able to talk about that in a more in-depth um in an in-depth analysis off of the genome.gov website and so it is so important for us to be just aware of what is happening around the world and how you're contributing to these type of ideologies that are being maintained in um, the cultural the culture of america so the culture of america is really changing its uh cultural norms and these norms are, you know, sometimes they're they're not congruent to some of the beliefs or um, moral compass that many of us hold. And so we have to like really pay attention to how we are contributing to all of these cultural norms around us. And so I wanted to start by saying this. I know last week I also talked about me wearing a dress. And so... um. I talked about how I was a tomboy and I was, I've always been a tomboy. I know that that is somewhat a, of a, um, uh, like a stereotype, you know, it's a, it's a label that people place on people. Um, but I just want to say that it was, it's always kind of been uncomfortable for me wearing a dress. There's a certain way you have to walk in a dress. There's a certain way you have to sit down um and i i always like being comfortable and so um today i wore another dress and i wore it to church and i i did feel uncomfortable again um but the lord had already explained to me i prayed about this okay because i've i've really been trying to sort of put away my old way of thinking and be transformed in the renewing of my mind with the word of god and so it was like I really felt uncomfortable because pretty much all of the dresses that I have, they are pretty fitted and my curves are really round. And so I just don't feel comfortable like really walking around like that all the time um, with a dress, like going outside and feel like bare or something. So um, if it was really up to me, the way I kind of felt about it was like I didn't want to wear the dress. And so God said it isn't about you know what what anyone else would think is really about what i know about you it's about what's in your heart and so your heart is centered on changing your heart isn't to like dress a certain way to appease a certain person or to dress this way to you know to um you know get attention or anything it's really about me being comfortable in the curves that i'm in and putting on a dress because this is actually the second dress that i wore this year and so um that's what God said. He said to me that I know what's in your heart and I know that you're changing. And so I thought about like, um, hi, hi, Salah. If you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A and I'll be sure to respond to it there. Okay. Um, so it was like, God was telling me that it isn't about, you know, what people think it's about what's in your heart because I know what's in your heart and your heart is changing and it's changing in favor of me. And so it's about like, okay, so if I didn't wear the jet dress, would I be being disobedient? Because God said that I that I should, because it's sort of transforming me into um into like hey, hope everyone is okay. Yes, everyone is fine. How are you today? Um, so 
what was really interesting about this is because so i have a bunch of dresses and um i didn't want to really specifically talk about myself so this isn't like a self-centered discussion this is really focusing on being transformed and transforming your life out of your old habits into new habits, it can be uncomfortable. It can be a very uncomfortable experience. And so you don't want to have this like, um, you don't want to have these feelings that, you know, um, you can't try something new just because you're not accustomed to doing that thing, right? Or just because we see something happening around in society and now it's like, oh, okay, this is just so horrific. It's horrible. The world is like just evil. Everyone is evil. You know, it's, it's like God, what he wants us to do is he wants us to transform our minds, transform our lives by changing our habits and understanding that it is time for us to really be mature enough and pray about things. So, yes, I did not want to wear the dress. I kept going back and forth like, God, I, I, I really, I have like a pants outfit that I want to wear that I could, you know, put on. And I, I just really didn't feel comfortable. You have to sit a certain way. You have to walk a certain way in a dress. And it's like, okay, I wore the dress. So, um, I have another dress that comes all the way down to my ankles. Now I'm like, okay, well, God, it's like, I have these dresses, but like, what dress can I wear that isn't going to show, show my curves, you, you know? And so it's like, we can't really hide, you know, what's, what's internally, you know, in you. It's like, okay, what, what motive do you have when you are going out here in this world and you're in interacting with other people? Like, so for instance, with me. My motive is to just do something different that is no longer a part of my old self. Because guess what? Once I am a new creation, the old has gone and, and the new has begun. And so that means I'm putting away those old habits. And now God is transforming me into a new person. And so what that means is that I can't just be subjected or continue to, you know, have trepidation for things that isn't going to be beneficial to my walk in christ and so that is what we have to do we might be so accustomed to living a certain life to the point where it's like oh, okay like i don't want to try that i don't want to do that. that that's uncomfortable you know it's like now when you're seeing the mutilation of children and you're seeing all of these different things within the transgender population i've talked about this several times throughout several of my podcasts um and how the transgender population is really hurting on the inside. You know, they have a high um, su suicidal ideation rate. And those things are something that is really, um, that needs to be combated in society. And so we, as a people, we need to really focus on the things that we can do within our means. And what we have the power to authorize is God in our life. And in order for us to move forward, once we authorize God, what we can do is we can then become like transitioning, transforming our lives. So we become transformational. And once we give God the authority, then our habits will change. So now it's like, okay, I wear, wore pants all year and this is my second dress. So now I'll be wearing a dress every Sunday. Okay, I, I made this commitment now to God, even though it's like, I, I really was resisting what okay so, so you have a question so what i wanted to ask was i'm a new woman i recently had the surgery and when i've been going out i've been feeling really insecure in this dress me and carry on looking but i don't know what to do okay recently had surgery okay so that means you transition from a man to a woman is that correct is that what you're saying salah i hope i'm pronouncing your name right salah so you, yes. Okay. So you are, you have transitioned from a man to a woman. Okay. So I don't really know what to say about that. Besides, I do have a scripture to say to you, to give to you, um, because it's like, that is something that, you know, you have to consider your age and, and something you've made a decision that is irreversible. I mean, I can't really tell you what to do with your life besides the fact that God loves you, regardless of whatever you've done or whatever experience you've endured. 
And so we as people, we just have to learn how to respect others. And so your choice is something that God has allowed you to do, right? And your choice is a part of your free will. Um, but you have to understand that God wants us all to be a certain way. And God doesn't want you to be unhappy with the person you are on the inside, right? And so I just, I'm not a supporter of surgery. I'm not a supporter of making these uh, life-changing type of decisions that are irreversible. The Bible tells us in first, um, so you're 16 years old and so you're just really lost. Okay. Um, what, what are you lost? Of? Like what, what's bothering you mainly? My family has been unsupportive and I really want God to support me, but my family are saying it's wrong, but I feel lesbian. I don't know what to do. Okay. So I don't want to turn into a counseling session. And so what I would um, really prefer for you all to do is um, this is to Deborah, Deborah Willis and Salah Zaman. If you all could just send me an email, my email is, um, Laws Life Health at Sudden Changes Corporation.org. Once again, it is Laws Life Health at Sudden Changes Corporation.org. And then I, I can just, you know, um, maybe pray with you if that's something that you like to do. And if you'd like for me to pray for you now, I can pray now. Okay. That's what I can say because I too have um, experienced what it means to, you know, be attracted to both the, the same sex and the opposite sex. So, I understand the struggle there. However, there there is a way to overcome those feelings that, you know, God didn't put there. God did not put those things there. Just as well as, you know, individuals are in this world, they feel that they could, you know, um, do a lot of different things. You know, um, when it comes to their sexual appetite, there's so much sexual immorality going around. But God has positioned certain things a certain way as so that they won't be overexerted in other areas. For instance, there are some people that think that it's okay to have sex with animals, right? Why would that be okay? Um, it isn't, right? It isn't morally correct. It's actually animal cruelty. And it's also something that is like a heinous act. Um, and it's, it's, it's deemed, you know, um, you know it's, it's shunned upon. And so when we think of individuals that have sexual intimacy with animals, that isn't something that is cool to do. And it isn't something that's morally correct. So we, in those areas, we have to follow a moral compass and say, hey, you know, um, it is not okay to have sex with animals. There have been instances where people wanted to have sex and marry animals, not just have sex with them, but marry them as well. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and then I'll be able to show you all that. I've talked about this on a previous podcast. So um, it isn't just about um, you having these uh, desires that you have sexually, but it's about how do you control the feelings that you have and how are you authorizing those feelings to dominate your life? Are you being led? Are you being navigated with these um, th these desires all the time? And so... That is something that you have to learn how to, um, you know, just control. And so the problem is, is that when you're having these desires, it's about you not having that lack of self-control. You want to have self-control. So anything that is um, uncontrollable is a form of witchcraft, right? Because you don't have control over it. So it's controlling you. You're not controlling it. Is controlling you. And so when you think about those things, you have to think about, okay, why are you letting this desire control you? It doesn't necessarily have to equate to you having this desire of, you know, sex with the same sex or sex with the opposite sex. It's all, you know, about you having control over your desires, about you having this control over um, th the things. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that now. So, so animals going so there are individuals that would like to um to marry animals so the main reason why i want to talk about this is, is something because salah and uh deborah had mentioned about deborah um mentioning 
her being lesbian and Salah transforming from one sex to the other. So we have some of the stakes that um, talks about uh, is animal marriage legal in the United States. So it is basically is prohibited, but there are a lot of people that would like to get married to animals. Um, and so we have to pay attention to these type of things because if, you know, we're not keeping a certain order, things will get out of order. And so what is society in a society that is without order? So needs to be a certain checks and balances and maintain, including impartiality as well, right? And so um, why should it be legal for animals to be married to humans, right? Um, is it okay for you to marry a 12-year-old? Um, you know, in some states, the minimum age to marry um, will it uh, have the parents' approval in some states, like uh, between the ages of 12 and 17 years old. And so you have to think whether or not it, are these ethical violations, right? <laughs> we have to think about what are the ethical implications. So there are many ethical impl implications to this. So there are some things that we should do and there are some things that we shouldn't be doing. And so I wanted to reflect on that. For instance, like comparing that to individuals wanting to marry animals. There are also sex offenders that would love to stay in a relationship with the person that they have been abusing, okay? They think that is so normal, and it isn't normal. So we can't normalize these sorts of things. The next thing is is how the, um, okay, so I have another question someone is asking, Derek. Okay, so Derek, I don't see your question here. Uh, maybe it's in the chat. I don't see it there. Um, so it looks like Derek raised his hand. Okay, so if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A. And so it isn't just about individuals wanting to um, marry animals, but about this, if eugenics is playing a key role in the extinction of certain populace of people, you have to think about, okay, is it okay to get this irreversible type of um, uh, surgery that could really, really cause some problems, right? And so sometimes um, some surgeries are irreversible. It doesn't mean that it can't be performed, um, but just thinking about the um, the actual consequences to certain surgeries, you know, um, those things could raise some questions and it also can um, cause some really, really strong mental health concerns. And those things, it should be addressed immediately. And so it looks like I have another question here. So in some states, you can marry at 16. So let's go ahead and look here. Um, I've talked I've talked about this on a previous podcast, though. Let's see. Um, I think I put as a age limit to marry in um, the United States. So this is what. I think I talked about this on the last podcast, which was love, hating. I think it was love, hating, but and um, there's one here where it says with no lower age limit on marriage. Okay, so it's actually like a map that I have found. I don't remember which one I had it on. Um. Oh, okay, so. So here it is. So, oh, they, they actually changed some of this because I think it was some places you could be. Okay, so, so yes, you see, you see this here? I'm sharing the screen. So um, this is from World Population Review. Um, basically shows the, uh, here are the additional, some, the additional states that allow the consent to marry from, with parents. So you, you just need parental consent. Um and must be 17 for males and 15 for females. And these are the states. It's California. You must have your uh, have written consent from at least one parent or each underage person. Florida is the other party cannot be more than two years older than the minor, right? Georgia cannot be more than a four year age difference. And those who are 17 must take premarital education classes. Missouri, a person over 21 cannot marry one under 18. Texas, you must have a court order. Okay, so Derek, I see that you're raising your hand again, right? 
So go ahead and put your question here in the Q&A and I'll answer it there. Like I just answered this question. Can you marry at 16? So yes, you can marry at 16. There, there are several, several different states that talks about this. For instance, in, in Ohio, you have to be 15 with your parental consent and judicial court order. In Idaho, you can be 16. Um, only if there is no more than a three-year age gap between the two parties. So 16, you could be 13 and 16 and marry in uh, Idaho, okay? So in Indiana, both are at least 16 years old or one of the individuals is not more than four years older than the other. Minors must be granted a judicial order approval to marry and complete emancipation. And so this is something to really... Uh, this is something to really focus on because just because you have the option to go ahead and do these type of things doesn't necessarily equate to it being okay. It isn't uh, the moral and ethical thing to do, right? So this is the reason why God has put it, it in place that, you know, the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And so Christ, when we think about the Holy Trinity, even though the Holy Trinity isn't mentioned in the Bible, um, we still know that the Holy Trinity exists. So it's the Father, which is God, the Son, which is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we have access to the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus uh, resurrected, um, he stayed on earth for about 40 days, and then he ascended to heaven. And then on 10 days later, he sent the Holy Spirit. And that's considered the day of Pentecost. And so what's so important about this is that I'm, I'm actually going to pull up this scripture here. Let's pull it up. So this, it should be first Corinthians chapter 11, 3. And it's, 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 this is the exact scripture. So, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Right. And so it doesn't say that the head of every man is man or the head of every woman is woman. It says that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And so what's really important to understand here is that, yes, you, you may have these feelings because it has been a part of the, the cultural norms in society. But I am not all the way too convinced that it's just cultural norms. I also believe that there could be a correlation between um, maybe vaccinations and um, desires. You know, you know, vaccinations have, yes, they do have side effects, but what other alternative side effects do they have that, you know, that we normally don't even talk about? So I, I believe that there is a correlation between not just um, vaccinations and um the vaccinations and the, uh, uh, what is it called? I'm trying to think of the word. I'm sorry. Um, those that are artistic individuals or, um, you know, biologically uh, challenged individuals. So I believe that there could possibly be a correlation. I don't know. It's just a theory, right? It's a hypothesis. It doesn't mean that my hypothesis is true. It's just something that I'm saying. So I try to find similar, okay, kind of random, but absolutely not. Don't ask me anything like that. So now do not disrespect me or you will be removed from this chat. Okay. So um, what's really important to understand is, is that, see, God wants us to make sure that, you know, um, we're analyzing things in a, in a thorough way. And so in order to like analyze something from a, um, a thorough analysis, you need to pay attention to everything. So I try to find common ground. So what's the common ground that everyone have here? Everyone has been vaccinated. Most people has been vaccinated. So vaccinations could have a correlation to maybe, um, you know, some some uh, mental health concerns, you know. And so I have talked about this on a previous podcast. So vaccinations do impact mental health. All right. And so with that being said, could that also be could that imply that it also messes or in, interferes or significantly impacts a person's sexual desires. How do we know that? Okay. It is just a hypothesis. That is something that I'm hypothesizing. I haven't done any research on that issue. Hopefully I will once after I get my PhD. 
all right so that was interesting like an interesting um you know something that i would like to research about okay so this going back to the scripture first corinthians 11 and 3 but i want you to realize that the head of every man is christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of christ is god so like deborah said she's lesbian like uh Salas just said that you know he just had a uh, surgery you know all of these different things is something that it's important to pay attention to you know we are all combating desires and it's like okay um what what are some of the desires that you're battling and you have we as a people we have to pay attention to the things that we need to change within ourselves it's so important to have self-reflexivity we need to have self-reflexivity in order for us to move forward as an individual and also to move forward as a society right so it's always going to be about having self-reflexivity okay now do i judge these people or do i judge absolutely not because guess what god gave you a choice god gives me a choice god gives all of us choice we all have free will and so that free will you're either going to encompass god in your life you're either going to have god as the moral compass as your navigation system that drives your decisions or you're going to have other things that can skew your life it can have different outliers that influence your decision making that is not contributing to your success but it's contributing now to your demise and so those are things that god doesn't really want you to have to go through god doesn't want you to go through unnecessary things god does not want you to go through anything unnecessary but if your choice is something that is allowing you to not focus on the things that god wants for your life and it's not allowing you to have a peace that transcends all understanding why allow yourself to continue in those type of habits right and so when we think about eugenics the way that i think about eugenics okay based upon the evidence of what eugenics is about right eugenics is something that is crucial to understand how are you contributing to eugenics and so i wanted to sort of shift focus here and i wanted to go um to uh let's go to mark chapter 14 verses 38 once again that is mark chapter 14 verses 38 so it says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, you understand that? So going back to what Derek had asked, can he marry at 16, right? If a person is within a certain amount of age, you know, you, you just need a person's parent consent. So what if someone who is a sex offender want to marry an underage person, right? What is to prevent that from occurring? So we have to think about all of these things. A person can be 18 years old and marry a, a minor, but what if, they, what if they have been a sex offender? What if they were younger? What if they were a little bit, you know, older, but still wanted to marry a minor? You have to understand how society is is uh, transitioning. And so although these things are very uncomfortable, don't allow those things to really, really, um, you know, discourage you from what God's plan is. When you see things, when you see it, you pray. When you hear it, you pray. So if God is showing you this and if God is allowing you to hear it and see it, what do you do? You pray. So I'm going to say it again. If you hear it, you pray. If you see it, you pray. So right now, I would like to just sort of interject and pray for, um, I would like to pray for uh, Salah and the lady Deborah. 
Okay. All right. Because Salah said that um he or she, I don't know, well, that that Salah had said that uh she was going having some insecure feelings about wearing a dress and stuff too. So um let's talk, let's pray about this. So Father God, we just lift them up to you, God. And if they are telling the truth, Lord God, we just ask that you just please really help them. Help them. And so since they brought this to, to my attention, I would like to pray for the people in the world that are really experiencing these things. And so God, we pray right now for all of the, the children in the world that have transitioned into becoming a new physical person. That a new person, but their biology, their physiology, the physiology of their body has not changed. So, God, although they have transitioned in these hormones and everything like that, God, we just ask that you just comfort them and you uh, that you just open their eyes to see things through your eyes and not their own. And you will let to hear through your ears and not their own, God. And just that you just remove the depression and you remove the anxiety, God, and allow to be who you've called them to be God that they do not have to be driven by their desires or their sexual appetite or any sexual desires that they have father God but let them see who you created to be let them see the character of a person show them their heart God let them see their heart God this is for all the children that have transitioned and the children that have that have detransitioned God, they are really impacted, God. So we just ask that you just you just remove all of the pain and the hurt and the emotional emotional stress that has been attached to the experiences that they have endured. And God, you reveal the truth to the world and let let the world see what is really happening, God. How how did this happen? Was it due to vaccines? What 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 is the common ground, God? It, it's the spirit. It's spirits, God. So God, right now we just cancel and we break every chain, every chain, every stronghold that has been placed upon the lives of your children, God. And we just ask you to snatch them back from the enemy right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We plead the blood of Jesus over your children, God. They was bought with a price, God, with the blood, with your blood, God. You paid the price. You paid the cost for their life. And so, God, we thank you right now that your plan will be fulfilled. Not theirs, not anyone else's, but your will, your plan, God. Continue to chase them with your love and chase them with, chase them, God. Chase them with your love so that they can experience what love is, God. And most importantly, God, heal them and, and reshape the things in their life that has been broken and shattered. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your atonement blood. Amen okay so going going back to this scripture mark 14 and 38 watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation so the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak you have to understand our flesh the flesh is always going to want to fulfill its own desires whatever those desires may be i had a conversation with my friend the other day and we was talking about desires and how women have emotional desires and men have logical desires but what i wanted to specifically say was that it doesn't matter what type of desires you have right the flesh is always going to want to fulfill those desires it's like okay you made this investment now you want to see a return on your investment but did you include god when you made that investment so you made this big investment you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in an investment that is no longer going to secure you any financial gain. So now you have financial losses. And now, guess what? You did that with your own level of understanding. You thinking logically. You thought you were thinking logically. And you thought that investment would produce you a return of investment. But the problem is, is it isn't about the the fact that you wanted to make an investment it's the fact that you didn't include god in your choice you wasn't being led by the holy spirit you just thought that your mind and your in your fleshly not would be able to provide you with something that would secure you a return on investment when god is saying look 
I will give you the things that you need. See, it isn't about the investment. It's about how are you in other areas of your life? See, God wants you to be a giver. When you give, it, it gets returned back to you. I've always said this because the Bible is true. I believe everything that the Bible says is true. So let me, I want to go to another scripture here. So if you go to the Bible, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. And I want to look on Bible Hub. So that way we can gain a synopsis of like the different translations, right? Um, so 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. It says, now he who supplies needs, I'm sorry. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. That's the NIV version. What this means is that God supplies the seed to the sower. So the more you give, the more you receive. You understand? These are spiritual principles that unlock things for you in a physical realm so it doesn't matter about what i don't have it's about what i've sold and since i'm a sower god has supplied me with the seed right so i have bread for food god pr provides for me you understand because i am a sower and so it isn't about what type of job or what level of income I have. It isn't about my academic education level. It isn't about my network. It isn't about any of that. It's about God supplies the seed to the sower. So you have to under and, and I want to I want to correlate another scripture with I know I'm kind of bouncing from scripture to scripture, but I do this because it's the point to, that I'm making. This scripture correlates with another scripture. So I want to go here and I um let's go, let's go to, to this one. Okay, so here in this scripture it says God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor. So that they lack nothing their heart desires. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them. And strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless. A grievous evil. This is in Ecclesiastes 6 and 2. So going back to uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and 10. God supplied a seed to the sower. So that means that. When I sow into the kingdom of God, God is opening up the windows of heaven over my life, spiritually, and also in the physical realm. So what that means is that I don't have to be worried about anything financially because God is giving me the seed that I need. So it isn't just about the seed financially, the uh, financial things. God also increases other areas of my life. For instance, God may give me a, a positive attitude increase, right? God may shift my perspective from one level to the next level. For instance, God may shift the type of investments I make. Specifically, maybe the investments I make in util utilization of my time. How am I using my time? Right. So God has now reshaped my perspective on the utilization of time. So it isn't just about God increasing the the seed to the sower that is financial increase, but it's also opening up a wide array of different areas in your life that needs improvement. I then figured this out because God show me that that's what he was doing i don't know why it took me so long to say this um but i i guess i was eventually going to this scripture about sowing 
And so this is this is the perspective that God has give, gifted me to understand through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter about what level of income you have, because guess what? You go back to the scripture, Ecclesiastes 6 and 2. God will give people wealth, possessions, and honor, and they will not lack anything that they hard desire, but they won't enjoy it. They will not enjoy it. Strangers will enjoy it. So when I think about wealthy, rich individuals, and I know quite a few of them, um, they, they're not really that happy because they always complain about something and say it. Um, it doesn't matter about how much money they have. It's, it's never ending. It's like, okay, I want this. Now I want this. So Google outdid me. Now we have to spend lunch talking about Google for three hours. Okay. You eat the lunch, wake the appetizer. And now we got to discuss Google doing something different. Okay. And so these are things that some people have that have wealth, possessions, and honor. These are the type of conversation they have. It's always about doing more, 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 more. And so this doesn't say anything about sowing. It doesn't say anything about they are sores. It just specifically says that God gives some people wealth and God gives some people possessions and honor so that they will lack nothing that their heart desires, but God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them and so strangers will enjoy them instead so you have to understand some people they have friends around them who are not their authentic friends have you ever been around people well you've had so like i have been around people where i knew that i had i have money so now i gotta pay for everything so the, uh, the only reason why they're around me is because of my money so it's like i don't want to be around that and so you have to think about that. You have to think about, okay, so what type of life are you living? Are you living a life that God has just given you wealth and given you possessions and given you honor? And so you get everything your heart desires, but are you really enjoying it? And so really it's about you having your perspective changed in a way where you not just you want to be able to help and pour into the lives of other people so going you have to correlate ecclesiastic 6 and 2 and you correlate it to second corinthians 9 and 10 and how god will supply seed to the sword so just because god has gifted you with all of this wealth possessions and honor and you get everything your heart desires if you change that up you have the ability to change the course because god is giving you free will God didn't make you robotic. He didn't make you robotic specifically because he wants you to love him voluntary. He doesn't want you to love him involuntary. What good is that? I mean, would you want to marry somebody that doesn't love you? I don't think any anybody want to do that. Do you know any woman that wants to marry a man here in America that does not love them? I mean, at least you want to know that the person love you, that they love you a little bit, okay? Now, I'm not saying some people don't just marry people for all different types of reasons. I am just simply saying, look, let's, let's be real about this. So God doesn't force you to love him. God doesn't force you to be obedient to him, right? He gives you a choice. That choice is your free will. And so with that, you have the choice to be a sore. And so a sore isn't someone who's always looking for something financially. For instance, I sold for about a year just so that my children would have attitude improvements, that they would have B attitudes. So the B attitudes are, let's, let's look at this. It wasn't just about them having beatitudes. I wanted to have beatitude too. So there are um, different beatitudes that's in the Bible. That's in Matthew 5 and 1 through 12. It's on my website. So let's, let's go there really quick and look at this. So the beatitudes. Blessed are, this is Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. 
disciples came to him and he began to teach them the be attitudes. So these are be attitudes, okay? These are the attitudes that I want to incorporate. These are the attitudes that I want my kids to incorporate. So guess what? I'm going to sow so that we can incorporate the be attitudes. These are so important. These are imperative. It is imperative to have the be attitudes, okay? So if I am sowing, giving my tithe and my offering, my offering, my tithe is just keeping the windows of heaven over my life. That means God is going to take care of me, you know, like financially, I'm good, you know, but my offering is an increase i want increase not just for me financially but also in our attitudes and our approach to life and our perspectives about life right so it isn't about you giving just so you can receive some money no i give so that i can improve in all areas of my life so that god can work in my life and change my perspective in multiple areas multi-faceted approach to my relationship in the kingdom of god so it isn't about you know you just tied and you give me your offering and you just think that you know god is going to keep the windows of heaven open no 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 he's going to do more than that he's going to change your perspective about your husband he going to let you see your husband the way God sees your husband. God will show you your husband the way he sees your husband. God will show you your wife the way he sees your wife. And you want to be, you want to people from your perspective. It'll be from the perspective of God. See, these are, this is what God does. This is what God been doing for me in my life. So it's about, he supplies the seed to the sower. And that didn't just in, increase in all areas of your life. It is infinite. You understand? See, when you think about God, you can't put limitations on God's ability. That's the thing. And when I figured that out, I was like, okay, okay. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, God. I know what you want me to do. So now, it's like the more and more I learn about God, the more I understand there is no limitation. So if he said that I want to give you peace that transcends all understanding, God is saying, look, I want you to have peace, not like just in your mind, but God wants you to even have peace in your body. You could just be laying there and, and you might have pain in your leg and God just wants you to have muscle relaxation. That's the peace. God, just, God wants you to have peace in the mind, peace in your muscles, peace in your body. Peace when you're walking in the store, when you trying to figure out which groceries to pick out. God want to make it efficient for you. He going to have you walk down the exact aisle and, and get exactly what you need. It's going to flow efficiently. Your life will flow efficiently. So you can't just limit God on your level of peace. God isn't limited when he gives you something. God expands our knowledge. He expands our wisdom. And the way he does that is when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then you're going the Holy Spirit is going to give you gifts. See, you're no longer going to be looking at your husband like, oh, he lazy. He don't take out the trash. I got to tell him when to mop the floor. God is not going to be letting you look at him like that no more. God is going to have you look at him from God's perspective and not your own. So you will see your wife is no longer nagging, but guess what? She's concerned because guess what? You're looking at her the way God sees her and not the way you see her. So these are all good things, right? And so I wanted to move forward into eugenics. And I, um, let me go ahead 
and just look at some of this here. So I wanted to talk about a few things. Let me go and um, get here. So give me one moment while I pull up this information. Okay, here we go. So I wanted to talk about uh, Margaret um, Sanger. And let's see, I need to go to... Oh, it's another video that I, I wanted to play too. Before I go into the history of Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and the Negro Project, okay? So just give me one moment. This loads. I'm just waiting for the computer to load. It's slow. Okay, so this is moving so slow. Okay, let's see if I just, I could just scroll up here and see the video. See if I can pull it up from here. I apologize. Sometimes when I, when I have so many tabs open, they just, it really sometimes gets slow like that. So, oh. Okay, let's see here. All right, pull this back down. Okay. Okay, so there is another, this is another video from the United States Holocaust Memorial. Um, so this video covers basically like the history of eugenics of racial hygiene in Germany and the United States throughout the late 19th and 20th century. Um, it discusses Dr. Patricia Habira Rice um, of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and Dr. Lutz uh, Kalber of the University of Vermont. And basically what they are exploring is the eugenic practices on how it paved the way for sterilization in the case of Nazi Germany, including the murder of those named unfit to produce. Um, so they are going to expose the racism, the anti-Semitism, and the uh, ableism and underpin the two. Okay, so here we go. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat. I'm going to start the video and then I'll be doing some commentating throughout the process. So this is a history of eugenics and it's on a YouTube video for the United States Holocaust Memorial. Hello, my name is Dr. Patricia Haber Rice and I'm the director of the Division of the Senior Historian at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. I'm Lutz Kalber, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Vermont. Today, Dr. Kelber and I are going to look at eugenics, also called racial hygiene, in Nazi Germany and in the United States, two countries deeply invested in implementing eugenic public health policies to improve the genetic makeup of their populations. We're going to look... Okay, so what, what she's saying is she, that they are trying to improve the genetic makeup, meaning that they want to eugenics sort of 
sponsors people in society that are Nordic populations, the Nordic race, meaning the more dominant race of people who are maybe more intelligent individuals that have enhanced IQs over individuals that um, have been deemed uh, artistic or feeble-mindedness, right? These are individuals that they feel should be sort of uh, sterilized in society from being able to reproduce. So that's what she means when she says racial hygiene and uh, re-engineering the genetic makeup of society how the two countries borrowed from each other when it came to implementing some of these eugenic strategies, specifically antenatal strategies, compulsory sterilization, and anti-miscegenation laws, which kept unvaluable members of society from reproducing. Before we begin, I want to point out that you're going to hear terms in this lecture today that are not appropriate to use in modern discourse. Today, words like moron, imbecile, and idiot are decidedly pejorative. In the early decades of the 20th century, however, these were actually terms. In those days, they represented a range of psychological classification. Okay, so she's saying that the word moron, um, uh, these type of terms was used in medical field. So they called people morons. They called them like, you know, um, just degrading type of terms is what she's suggesting. Associated with hereditary feeble-mindedness something today we would call an intellectual disability. Yes, yeah, so that would be considered an intellectual disability, someone that they have deemed feeble-minded or someone with that are artistic or are, so that would be intellectually a uh, disability. Okay. The term describes the degree of intellectual impairment with idiocy signifying the highest degree of impairment and moronity the least. Although these terms were meant to classify, in the end, they became the means to isolate those with intellectual disabilities from the rest of society. Okay, so eugenics it basically separated other people that were intellectually disabled um, from the rest of society. So people that were sort of uh, artistic, they wanted to separate them because they did not want them to reproduce individuals of their kind. So a uh, person that is intellectually dis disabled has a high probability of producing someone else that is intellectually disabled. So eugenics will seek to extinguish or eliminate those people from reproducing. So they won't have any more children at all. Um, they will be forced to be sterilized. We need to be aware that our language constantly changes over time. And that these terms, which once had scientific meaning, eventually acquired offensive connotations. So, what is eugenics? Eugenics, or the idea of good birth, was the scientific movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At the core of the movement's belief system was the conviction that human heredity was fixed and immutable, that it's nature, not nurture, that makes you the human being that you are. So, nature versus nurture nurture right um your eugenics it is it could be it could be fixed because once you sterilized you won't reproduce those type of people in society anymore that's what eugenics is the idea in a nutshell is this that if you can breed a better dog or horse as humankind has been doing for centuries we can breed a so you, if you could breed a better dog, if you could breed a better horse, you could breed better humans, right? With higher IQs, with higher intellectual stimulation, with individuals with higher, um, uh, you know, muscle elasticity, individuals that are athletes, you know, these are hot commodity type of uh, uh, characters and people that they would love to be able to become a part of the Nordic race. And so in order to get rid of those people that are deemed less or unfit in society, they need to be sterilized. And this is something that is you what eugenics is all about. So I'm not saying that I agree with this. I'm just giving you the facts about what eugenics is want to put down in layman's terms, the way Dr. Rice is speaking about it here. Better person and a better national body. Eugenics was an international movement, and in its heyday, right before the First World War, Great Britain, 
the United States and Germany were leaders in the movement. Each might have had their own agenda, but most eugenicists everywhere had some ideas in common. First, Okay, so a eugenicist is someone who studies the human genome. They are the ones who can tell you about the um, the sterilization of that, that can take place. They can tell you about a person's uh, uh, hereditaries. They can tell you about their um, pre-existing conditions and everything else. So eugenicists, they basically uh, study the uh, hereditary um the hereditary uh, diseases of the body, and so um, that that's they do a lot more than just that. But I just wanted to just let you know, like if somebody that has Parkinson's or someone that has Huntington's chorea or sickle cell anemia, all of these different things is something that eugenicists will be able to study. But now, when you hear the term, um, you no longer really hear the term eugenics. You'll hear the term genome. And that is something to really pay attention to in society when it comes to eugenics. That is what it's referring to. They wanted to find who in their society is valuable to pick out the good stock and encourage them to reproduce. See, the good stock of people. Those athletes, those people with good high, high IQs, those people who are contributors in society. These are all of the people who should be a part of the Nordic race. It isn't about, you know, um, I believe that currently, current eugenics isn't about race um, or the specific color of the person. Um, I believe that it can turn into racial sterilization. Uh, but I believe that right now, with the transgender population being so uh, prominent in society to try to, you know, somewhat transition their, their bodies, they are the ones who are being targeted. And I don't believe that the transgender population has a specific race, right? Transgender people are of all races, of all origins. And so that is something that we need to really, really be concerned about. Now, does it, you know, uh, you know stop focusing on race? Absolutely not. I, I believe that eugenics will continue to always focus on race, but it, I believe that it's more... So focus on the people that are intellectually um, challenged versus the 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 racists right now. Um, I believe that they, they can eradicate uh, racists through racial and ethnic cleansing by using CRISPR technology. Um, but that would be an entire different discussion. It isn't for this discussion right here. So that's why I really didn't want to talk about the specific racial and ethnic cleansing of a specific race right now. Um, currently the transgender population has no one specific race and they are participating in what we would consider uh, eugenics because of the sterilization that it is um, sponsoring. Second, they want to define the bad stock, those who are seen as a burden in society and discourage them from reproducing. And third, they want to keep the races from intermarrying. And we'll see the results of these efforts today. First, in compulsory sterilization laws, both the United States and Nazi Germany imposed in the first half of the 20th century. Indiana enacted the world's first eugenic sterilization law in 1907. It targeted confirmed criminals, idiots, imbeciles, and rapists housed in state institutions. Okay, you see, you all see that and hear that. So the Indiana sterilization law basically targeted criminals, idiots, imbeciles, and rapists. That's who they sterilized. That's who their target was. Uh, this was approved March 9th of 1907. So if they went to jail. They were studying these criminals. They were considered idiots. They were some uh, considered imbeciles and rapists. So they wanted to eradicate their race. No, I'm sorry, not eradicate their race eradicate those type of people from reproducing in society by sterilizing them. Policies such as eugenic sterilization or the establishment of state institutions to separate undesirable individuals from the public are examples of what sociologists call oppressive othering. Deviant characteristics such as being inferior or dangerous are ascribed unto others and oppressive measures employed against them. 
Now, we can consider this as a target for race but you know like when you think of criminals you can't say that all criminals are one specific race we know that criminals are there's a certain population of a race that is dominating the prison system which is the african americans and hispanics um but we can't just say that it is just only inclusive to those criminals you know so they've included rapists they included imbeciles and idiots they you know, people who uh, they may consider someone who is rioting, right? That is deviant type of behavior, as as Doctor, um, as Doctor. Uh, in a book published in nineteen twenty-two, what is his name? Kabler talking about. So he's saying that those individuals that are deviant in society. Eugenicist Harry Laughlin proposed a model sterilization law. He was the director of the Eugenic Records Office at the time. It was a research institute that gathered information on what were believed to be hereditary qualities in the population. Laughlin intended his model law to be a possible blueprint for a federal law. This never materialized. But it did influence the creation of state eugenic sterilization laws. Laughlin's model sterilization law targeted a heterogeneous group of people. Okay, so I'm just read off some of these. So the um, Harry Laughlin's model sterilization, excuse me, sterilization law of 1922, basically separated inadequate um, classes. So those were people that were um, had like a prognosis of intellectual disability. They were considered insane or psychopathic. The uh, criminalistic epileptic people inebriated um people that that utilize drugs or um habituates um they were diseased people that were suffering from like tuberculosis syphilis uh, other diseases chronic illnesses infections um segregable uh, diseases blindness death deformed or dependency individuals that were um never doers or they were homeless they were uh these are the type of individuals that they were targeting in the model for the sterilization law those with mental so i just fast forward the of the 1924 virginia sterilized okay so i um, talked about this three generations of imbeciles are enough end of quote carrie was so that's in his opinion writing for the majority Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, quote, It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute a generate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfed from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So they wanted to eradicate three generations of people. They felt like if you eradicate three generations, they are not going to be able to reproduce their offspring. So they're going to become basically extinct in society. And that is the, what eugenics is all about. So i like to fast forward here a little bit. Diagnosis permitted physicians and psychiatrists to include not only those diagnosed with an intellectual disability, but also the socially aberrant or those whom Nazi medical authorities deemed socially aberrant. Vagrants, prostitutes, mothers of children, especially if they were on welfare, petty criminals, juvenile delinquents, and in large numbers relative to the German population, Roma, Sinti, so-called gypsies. Anti-miscegenation laws were racist laws enacted by American states to prohibit interracial marriage and interracial sex. Such laws date far back in American history, but in the 20th century, anti-miscegenation as a policy was also adopted by eugenicists who believed that race mixing would lead to the racial deterioration of the white race. In 1900, sociologist and eugenicist Edward Ross used the term race suicide to disapprove of mixed race relationships, as did President Theodore Roosevelt in 1902. Virginia's eugenic sterilization law of 1924, which targeted those with insanity, idiocy, imbecility, feeble-mindedness, or epilepsy, became law with another act on the same day. That act was called the Racial Integrity Act. It was unlawful for any white person to marry anyone but another white person. The law was enforced. Infractions constitute felonies punishable with up to five years in prison. 
If an interracial couple lived together without being married, they could also be charged with what was called fornication. The intended outcome of both acts was the same, to prevent an alleged... Okay, so let me move forward. I'm going to try to go to the end. measure, even as the crimes of the Nazified patients, including 10,000 children. The overwhelming number of victims were German Aryans with mental and physical disabilities. Even the final solution can be seen in this light. By culling out the Jews, the so-called unwanted disease population in German-occupied Europe, the genocide of European Jewry may be seen as the ultimate eugenic measure. Even as the crimes of the Nazified medical community largely work to discredit eugenics among the scientific community, the practice of eugenics continued, particularly in North America, where sterilization policy continued against African American and Native American minorities. Okay. All right. So that's that with that video there. Um, so we see that eugenics is basically um it, it was a, a horrific situation for those in the holocaust the jews and so they went through a, a some terrible experiences and now we see that it has sort of spilled over into the united states and it's still prevalent in society so eugenics is not it's a horrible horrible type of personality and many people that support eugenics efforts are not, you know, really fit for society as they try to make their counterparts out to be. So really, in actuality, it should be reversed because eliminating people because of their inabilities is just cruel, heinous, and sinister, right? And so let's look at some of the um, things about Planned Parenthood. So I talked about um, Margaret Sanger the other day um, and how she was basically, um, she is the, the founder of Planned Parenthood. I talked about her with the, um, her and the Negro Project. It was basically like a wide discussion um, that was talked about with Planned Parenthood across the country. And so Margaret Sanger, she was a racist that wanted to exterminate blacks, Jews, Hebrews, and Latin um, populations of people through eugenics, okay? And she was the founder of Planned Parenthood. So let's look here. So going on to the Planned Parenthood website, their history, um, basically they started in, um, back in 1916. Um, the idea of Planned Parenthood began at the first birth control clinic. Clinic was in Bronzeville, Brooklyn. Um, so today they have about 600 different locations. They also operate in about 49 different local affiliate uh, offices. Um, they have more than 2 million patients each year. Um, and so they talk about, let's see what they have to say about Margaret Sanger on this issue. For as long and so just remember that Margaret Sanger, she sponsored the Negro Project and wanted to eliminate blacks, Jews, um, and Latin individual populations. As long as most of us have been involved in this organization, Margaret Sanger's legacy on race has been an open question. What people want to know is, was she or was she not a racist? And we've answered every question except that one. We've defended her as an avenger of bodily autonomy and self-determination who unfortunately and inconvenient. Okay. The, uh, all right. Now, autonomy. Yeah. All right. So autonomy is your free will. You have a choice, um, individual's choice. But just think about this. When you have all of these outliers that is influencing your decision, um, what that does, it, it, it skews your ability to make the right type of choice, right? You have over 2 million people going to Planned Parenthood every year. So what is the chance that you're in a school that other students are not going to Planned Parenthood, right? So it's like the likelihood of uh, someone you know going to Planned Parenthood is gonna be high. They have over 2 million patients a year. So 
let's look back and, and see what they are talking about with Margaret Sanger being a racist. Conveniently was a product of her time. We've surrounded her with figures like W.E.B. Du Bois as a way to suggest that her eugenic beliefs were the norm. And we've worried that if we were the ones to call her racist, we'd be ceding ground to opponents of sexual and reproductive health. We've disavowed her eugenicist and ableist ideology. Zora Neale Hurston wrote, there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. This year answered. We can no longer afford to reconcile or revise Margaret Sanger's legacy. We must reckon with it. Okay, so that still doesn't say anything. It, it, it says that you're not going to reconcile Margaret Sanger's legacy. Um, you're going to reckon with it, but that still Still, you're not saying what the truth is. The problem, the problem in society is that I'm not going to say in society because we are all sort of existing with society. It doesn't mean we are a part of the cultural norms of society. So I'm going to be very specific and say that this is an issue because if you can't identify the problem, then you won't be able to reach a resolution. And so eugenics is something that, you know, having an organization that was founded on the basis of eugenics, which is basically the eradication of blacks, Jews, Hebrews, and Latin communities of people, when most of your population of patients are blacks, Jews, uh, what blacks, Jews, Hebrews, and Latin people, why would this be okay? For you not to acknowledge and speak about those things of eugenics. Eugenics is a very serious allegation to be able to support that and still be thriving in society. Most businesses barely even have a hundred thousand customers. Planned Parenthood has two million of them. This is something that they should definitely be able to address and address it immediately, okay? There is no way that I would want to have anything to do with Planned Parenthood. They could be giving out some preventative measures to, to people, right? What use is that? What if they are giving out treatment to individuals and then they're going out giving out condoms and there's something wrong with the condoms? The condoms have you you uh sterilization on it, you know. Who knows? What if you don't you don't want to be sterilized, do you? Why would you trust an organization that was founded on the basis of sterilizing people? That doesn't make any sense. So that means that if you're gonna go there, is there a chance that your womb could be sterilized? Is there a chance that if you use that condom from them, that they're going to have ingredients on it that is going to sterilize you? I'm, I'm just joking here, right? I, I'm not serious about that part. But I just want you to understand that it's imperative for you to be able to have critical thinking and analyses in order for you to have, you know, utilize more than 20% of your brain and utilize the, the quality that God has gifted you with the power of the Holy Spirit. Use the Holy Spirit. God has given you the Holy Spirit for you to be able to use. And when you use the Holy Spirit, you walk with the Holy Spirit. You, you just, you are powerful with the Holy Spirit. Use the power that is within you to have discernment. There is no way that this organization, which are uh, remarks by Alexis McGill Johnson, and that she clearly still evades the fact that Margaret Sanger has what? Supported eugenics. She founded Planned Parenthood on the basis of eradicating, eliminating, exterminating Blacks, Jews, Hebrews and Hispanics. There is no way that you should be able to continue to avoid that question. So individuals like this, organizations like this should not be supported. I don't believe in supporting anything or anyone 
that do not acknowledge that a problem exists. You first have to you have to acknowledge that the problem exists and then you can work towards a solution of getting those things resolved. And although I don't agree with the purpose or the, the goals of Planned Parenthood, the number one thing is it's about maintaining those ethics. Ethics is so real that it's real for me, right? And so this is something that we as a people, we need to make sure that we're supporting organizations that value those ethics in society and can maintain those ethics throughout the organization being open, right? And so let's, let me go ahead and continue reading here. So it says Planned Parenthood traces its roots back to a nurse named Margaret Sanger. Uh, okay, but um, that's not saying that she's the founder. She is actually the founder. Um, okay, Sanger grew up in an Irish family of 11 children. Um, they're giving her history, okay? Uh, her mother uh, in fragile health from pregnancies, including seven miscarriages, died at the age of 50 of tuberculosis. Her mother's story, along with her work as a nurse in the Lower East Side of New York, inspired Sanger to travel to Europe and study birth control methods. I don't care about her history. Her history is meaningless her history doesn't mean anything uh, the the fact that she has founded this organization on the extermination of other people is downright unethical and very wrong okay now i understand some people say that history is something that we should consider well if, if history is something that we should consider why has the critical race theory been eliminated from the classroom? So no longer talk about black history, but we can look here on the Planned Parenthood's website and see the history of Margaret Sanger, who was a racist, a bigot, and she hated other races of people to the point where she wanted them to be exterminated. She exterminated people with sterilization. Why do we need to know her history? We don't hear the history about anything in society that contributes to the racial, the, the racial, the spreading of racial uh, racist ideologies anymore, right? And so if this is the case, why are we still able to have organizations receive funding, be able to thrive in society, on the basis of organizations that have been maintained with the support of eradicating entire races of people this is ridiculous ridiculous notion ridiculous ideology and it's mediocre okay and there's no way that some people won't experience some trepidation from this trepidation from it right so you have here, they talking about more and more of Sanger, more and more of Sanger, how she was an advocate, how she supported injustices. Okay, now let's see. Margaret Sanger's racism and belief in eugenics are in direct opposition to Planned Parenthood mission. Planned Parenthood denounces Margaret Sanger's belief in eugenics. Further, Planned Parenthood denounces the history and legacy of anti-blackness and gynecology and the rights movement and the mistreatment that continues against black, indigenous, and other people of color in this country. Yay! Okay. They finally acknowledged it all the way at the end almost, right? So what now, what, what's the next thing from here? What I would like to know specifically is if since they have denounced all of the racist um ideologies of margaret sanger how have they done it what what have they implemented in order to not support eugenics and society if you say you're no longer a supporter of these type of ideologies if you say that you don't support eugenics and you say that you're not for the blackness of uh, gynecology, right? The racist blackness of gynecology. What steps have the organization taken to make sure that they are not maintaining eugenics in the African-American community? What steps have they taken in order to make sure that they are not maintaining eugenics in the Jewish community, in the Hebrew community? in a hispanic community 
So there's one thing to say that you're doing something and that you're, you know, you're not supporting this and you're not supporting that. But what steps have you taken in order to prevent eugenics from the spread, the widespread rate in these races of Africans, Jewish people, Hebrew, and the Hispanic community? So they talk about the new, new uh, millennial a second century. They talk about all of these different things. They talk about the Supreme Court allows states to ban abortion. They talk about this stuff. But I don't see anything here that talks about how they have implemented preventative measures to stop eugenics from taking place within the black community, the Hispanic community, the Jewish community, and the Hebrew community. Basically, the minority community. So, that's the question, Planned Parenthood. I have that question. What preventative measures have Planned Parenthood implemented in order to prevent eugenics from taking place within the minority communities? Since they no longer support the stand of Margaret Sanger. See, that's the thing. The problem that I have with this is most people, they like clicking on the video. So if a person just comes here, they don't have a lot of time to read all of the extra stuff that Planned Parenthood has put here. They're going to click on the video. They're going to say, see that they, they're they suggesting that they're not supporting Margaret Sanger after also comparing her to W.E. Du Bois and all of these different people. And now giving her life history and all of these different things. And then they're going to say in one little paragraph that they don't support eugenics. So it's so important to be able to pay attention to things and to be able to see through what is being said. You know, my son, he always says, Mom, you know, we, we can't just listen to what people say. We have to listen to their actions. And I say, well, how are we going to listen to their actions? But you got to see what they do and not what they say. Because, see, they can say one thing, but they but their words is deceiving. Their words don't correlate. It don't match what they say it that's not what they do what they say they don't do so pay attention to that all right so um moving forward so i wanted to talk about here um actually let me just sort of shift focus so that those are the things about eugenics I'll continue eugenics tomorrow um hopefully i'll be able to talk about esther i did want to read some um some of the biblical women in the bible it's like a lot of information it is a lot of information on this blog but women's health is so incredible and it's so crucial we have to make sure that we, we're maintaining our health right that's so important and so let's see i think i left i wanted to talk about uh the toilet paper so i'm going left off on real I think it was a real, was it real? I think it was real paper. No, it was public goods. I left off at public goods. So maybe I could finish up and talk about um, the public goods toilet paper. So just remember, we are not going to be a people that just go by what we hear. A person's words are so deceiving and so have to pay attention to if they words are matching what they say and if they words don't don't support that organization don't support them for anything because if they'll deceive you in your face and they will deceive you they will deceive you behind your back there is no way that you should be able to trust anything that an organization says when they are founded and based on unethical practices Unless they can show you and tell you how they have deterred from those ethical implications, there is no reason to support that organization. So, hey, if you want to stay, make sure you don't support Planned Parenthood, specifically with them practicing eugenics, which is the racial hygiene and the, the racial sterilization 
of entire minority races of people that include African Americans, Jews, Hebrews, and Hispanics. So stay safe and take God with you on your journey so that you're not deceived in this world that is so deep. Okay. Um, all right. So I wanted to talk about this tissue. I was talking about um public goods before I had left off on their personal care bundles. And so I'm gonna look at some of all of their personal care. I was talking about their, I think it was the oil, the last time. That's what I was talking about, the, their oil. So they pretty affordable look like. They have conditioner for $8.75. But let me just go give you all a glimpse of their about section again. So it's all good. Many of the toughest problems that we face are the result of the products big companies produce. That's why they're committed to making healthier more sustainable choices easy and accessible to all people so they have um different products that includes 100 percent recycled uh post-consumer plastic no toxic chemicals and organic ingredients so they they say that um they always going to buy stuff for their homes but by creating the most sustainable version of the things that people need the most we can have a net positive uh, impact on the planet Today, that means 100% recycled consumer plastic bottles and tree-free paper. It means sourcing organic ingredients and avoiding toxic chemicals. It means donating excess products. It means carbon offsetting both through reforestation and carbon neutral shipping. But we're getting started. Every day brings a new chance for us to, to be even better, better to our planet. So we're always improving how we do things. And you can find more details about some of the folks who we help uh, us to do that below. So um, public goods have partnered, partnered with Eden Reforestation Project projects. Um, so um, we partner with Eden Reforestation for their combined mission of reducing extreme poverty and restoring healthy forests. That's really nice. For every order placed, public goods plants a tree with Eden's help. To date, they have planted over 363,000 trees and still is counting. That's more than 18 times the number of trees in Central Park. They also have partnered with uh, St. Mary's Food Bank. Um, so they have an ongoing partnership, ongoing partnership with St. Mary's Food Bank and the Community Food Bank in New Jersey. So they donate all of their near expired products so someone in need can benefit from them. This is so good. This is so good. And so with them saying that they donate their near expired products, that's really good. Because most of the products that people get from the food pantry, they are all expired. Usually, mainly all expired. So that is something they're giving away stuff that's nearly expired. That's something to pay attention to. So they don't compromise on quality. They like uh, testing that every ingredient that they use is clean and healthy for sourcing the finest organic cotton from their towels. They don't release a product into the world until um, they're sure that it's meeting a very high quality of sustainable quality of standards. So all of their products have are cruelty free. They're paraben free, comp compostable packaging, vegan friendly. That's nice. Non GMO. And they are all organic. Um, so their bottles are made from 100% recycled post-consumer plastic. So they source biodegradable alternatives to single-use plastic. Their paper products are tree-free. Even the shipment is carbon offset and they plant a tree for every order. Their products are healthy. Um, our products are made from wholesome ingredients that are always clearly labeled. They're free of parabens, sulfates, toxic chemicals, and unnecessary additives they are pure and simple um they offer organic non-gmo groceries with plenty of vegan and gluten-free options this is so good they even have the women's daily vitamins here they have the uh vitamin b complex with electrolytes they have fish oil 1200 milligrams they have um vitamin c and a lot of different vitamins um the Basically, it says that they are beautiful. So they design products to be beautiful in your home. Their products use simple, minimum packaging to complement any space. 
They're obsessive about design. So many of the products that they buy have been designed to scream at you from a store shelf. Um, say on Instagram ad. Um, but they do create products and packaging to look cool in your home. So they grow their houseware line with the same obsessiveness that applies to the grain of a cutting board and, and how a water glass feels in your hand. So membership get, the membership gets you wholesale prices. So there is a, a difference in between. They, they only make about 80% profit margin on products. So they stay below 25% that the savings are passed down to you. So um that's that's good. But I don't know how they would make 25%. That that would be 80/20 because uh the entire product is, can only be 100%. So but they stay below 25%. So that should be 80% profit margin and 20% below um to pass savings down to the customers. So that is public goods. Let's look at the cost of their tissue they oh they they have um they have plants let's look at some of their plants that they sell so they have house plants plant accessories they have the pink anthurium six inch which is forty nine dollars and ninety five cents that look nice they have the uh ruby pink ruber tree eight inch $67.95. They have the uh, Calithia White Fusion 6 inch. That's $51.95. So um, they have the Flat Leaf Parsley Seed Packets that you can buy. They, they have Sweet Basil Seed Packets, Cilantro. Um, they just basically have a lot of different plants here. And they look nice too. They come, they look like they, uh, you could, nice uh, pot holders. Planters, stoneware, watering cans. They have a lot of nice stuff. I think I'm going to shop here. Let's look at their um, home products. So their home products are... Let's look at all home. I'm waiting on it to load. Okay, so that wasn't coming up. My internet. Okay, so they got dinner plates, but so my since my internet is not coming up that good, it's just a slow low. I apologize for that. But you all can go on the website and access public goods um dot com and be able to look at the wide array of different products that they are offering. Um, I wanted to specifically look at some of their tissue. So let's let's uh price the tissue. So it doesn't look like it's loading. Wait a couple more minutes here. See. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, it doesn't look like that is coming up for me. And there's a couple more minutes left in the podcast. And so I would just like to let you all know, thank you so much for joining me. 
um on this podcast about eugenics tonight. So let me go ahead and pray and um I'll close out tonight. Okay. So Father God, thank you for allowing us to retain your word. Thank you for making us aware of what is happening in the world. Thank you for showing us the things that we need to pray about, Father. And so we just pray right now. We lift up everybody in the world to you, God. We ask that you just shake it and awaken all of us, including me, God. Every single person in this world, Father God, whatever it takes for us to fulfill your plan, will and purpose, let it happen, Lord. Keep our hearts softened and melted for you, God. Allow us to choose you in our free will. Allow us to choose you voluntarily to love you, voluntarily to be obedient to you, voluntarily do these things because you did not make us robotic, Lord. And so we want to please you. We want to satisfy you. We want to be obedient to you, God. And so I just, we just thank you today, God. And we just ask that you just please remove all of the obstacles and barriers that are in our path that, you know, will try to stop us from fulfilling what you have called us to do, God. You have called us. You have chosen us. So God, implement what needs to be done. Pivot us exactly we need to be lord god orchestrate what needs to be orchestrated in our life so that we can fulfill your plan lord and so we just thank you god we appreciate you and we just ask that you just please allow your will to be done in our life in the lives of everyone that we know and so god we see right now that the power of the holy spirit is greater inside of us than any in this world and god let us embrace the holy spirit let us be sensitive to the voice of the spirit and let us be obedient to the holy spirit so that we can walk in righteousness and walk in a life that is obedient to you and so that we can find favor in your sight lord god convict our hearts for any and everything that displeases you and that is disobedient to you god uproot it out of us and replace it with those things that are favorable to you that are pleasing to you and obedient to you lord god in the name of Jesus Christ, it is still in your time and blood. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, please remember to send me an email if you needed prayer or if you wanted to suggest a topic or become an author or do some community service. Whatever your needs are, send me an email, okay? You can email me at uh, Laws Life Health at Sudden Changes Corporation .org, or you can send an email to info at Sudden Changes Corporation .org. Thank you all so much for joining me today. You all have a good night. I will see you all tomorrow.